Hello, good evening. Ash from London, back with another um, top 10. Back to a normal top 10 now. Uh, I'm ranking um, my 10 favourite albums by uh, another band from uh, the old days, although they are still around today. And uh, One band I've known pretty much all my life and I've been a fan of as long, really. I'm um, talking about the Rolling Stones. You may have heard of them. They've... Uh, uh, one one band that have, uh, have just been huge the whole her whole existence really I mean they were huge in the sixties huge in the seventies and just carried on. Um, they're part of the uh, the English psyche I guess now everyone knows they're um, just so famous everyone just knows about the Beatles everyone just knows about them. the thing about the Rolling Stones is that they just carried on I mean the Beatles split in nineteen seventy and that's fifty years ago plus you know and uh, the Stones are still around today and still releasing uh, new material from time to time. Um, I was a big fan of theirs, uh, mainly through the 70s uh, into the 80s um, somewhat. Um, I didn't really follow them too much beyond that in terms of uh, the records, the studio releases. Um, the, uh, the, the classic period was uh, sort of like late 60s, early 70s in my opinion. Um, uh, there's um the thing about the Rolling Stones is I've always sort of like considered seeing them in three distinct eras. Uh, depending on which uh, second guitarist they had. Um, the, uh, the first era was the sixties, of course, with Brian Jones um, on guitar. The second era was the Mick Taylor period, late 60s, 70s. And then since then, Ronnie Wood was on, on the guitar. Um, some may argue that there's a, the, the kind of fourth phase was um, post Bill Wyman, the bass player, leaving, where they um, carried on as a four piece. But uh, I think that's now the hinder there, really. Uh, those are the kind of three eras I'm kind of thinking of, and I think the guitarists of that those particular eras um, gave them the distinct sounds of those um those times. Anyway, yeah, Rolling Stones. Not really a lot can say that people don't already know. Uh, Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Charlie Watts. There were three core members that have been there throughout their existence. Bill Wyman, bass player from the start, um, who retired from the band oh, about ninety one, ninety two, I think it was. Uh, he was never replaced. Um, uh, since then, the guy called Daryl Jones has been playing bass with them as a, as a sort of hired hand, really. He's never officially joined the band. He's been with them since 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 Bill Wyman left, basically. Don't know why he never became a full-time member. Could be a mutual thing, I don't know. But um, he's just there as a like a, almost like a session player. Uh, then, of course... Um, Brian Jones left, well, was asked to leave uh, towards, towards the end of the 60s and sadly passed away, of course. And then Mick Taylor joined for a run of about five, was he on five albums or four albums? About five albums altogether. And he left uh, in the early mid 70s, early to mid 70s. And then Ronnie Wood from The Faces, plus other bands um, from the Jeff Beck group as well, wasn't he? Ronnie Wood. Uh, he joined, has been with them ever since. Uh, so um, those are the three. Um, main phases. Uh, there was Ian Stewart, um, keyboard player, who was actually a band member in the early days, but he um, kind of um, left out of the lineup. I think something to do with uh, his image at the time didn't fit the, the, the rest of the Rolling Stones, but they, they kept him on uh, as, as keyboard player. He used to play with them live and um, still did up until his death. He was still doing the piano, mainly a piano player, honk-tonk piano player. But he also became their tour manager and um, was uh, such an influence on them, such a mate to the band, they actually included him as a band member when they were inducted into the Rock and, Hall, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in, the, in the, the year they were inducted, so that was, that was quite a good gesture. Uh, there was quite, quite a lot of regular collaborators. Uh, another keyboard player was Nicky Hopkins, played with them uh, quite a lot on, on, on stage and on, um, in the studio. Uh, Bobby Keys, saxophonist, he's been with them for a long time on and off. He's now sadly... Uh, not no longer with us, but he was with them in the studio and on tour. But um, and many other um, singers, musicians have uh, joined the party along the way. I would say. Anyway, uh, less chat. I think um, Rolling Stones, uh, one of the biggest bands ever, uh, second only to the Beatles in the sixties and beyond. You know, and they're just everywhere. Okay, so these are uh, what I've done here. I've, um, I don't have all their albums. I must admit, so I have got, got quite a big chunk of them. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm ranking my favourite ten studio albums from uh, least favourite to favourite, I guess, the usual usual story. Uh, this is my personal choice. Um, everyone's welcome to put their their opinions in the comments below, maybe with their own ranking or um, a critique of my ranking or whatever. And uh, so, yeah, less chat, more stones. Let's go. Um, 
start off with number 10. Number 10 is a 1980 release, Emotional Rescue, which um, was the, from the Ronnie Wood era. This is more one of them, well, let's say more recent ones, but 1980, so it's ages ago, isn't it? But yeah, Emotional Rescue, I thought this was a pretty good album. This was um, the second after the, um, their kind of that, where they had a slight style change, where they got a bit more funkier and a bit more into that kind of disco sound almost. They'd had a bit of a return to form um, of the previous album, Some Girls. And this kind of carried on that kind of sound. Uh, I got into this mainly because I saw them on this tour. Um, it was the um, they did this huge tour. Um, they'd not toured for a long time, I don't think. And um, they did this massive tour in the states where they're just playing stadiums. And uh, in that, that was in 1981, the year after this was released. And then in '82 they came to Europe, and I saw them at Wembley Stadium. And uh, they were just incredible, really, really good. Um, and they didn't really promote too much off this album. Actually, I can't remember. Um, what they played, um, they played She Souls Cold, and what was the other track, Let Me Go I think was the other track they played, can't remember, that's a long, 1982 is quite a while ago, but uh, yeah, this is a pretty good album, so pretty pretty funky, uh, even a bit, a bit of reggae influence on here somewhere, what was the reggae, was it, I can't, oh, it might be Let Me Go actually, was that the reggae one, can't remember now, or was it Send It To Me? Anyway, I've not played it for a while, so um, I don't t- tell a lie. I've been listening to it a little bit, but I've not really listened to it in any great detail. I just did a, did a quick check there. I still liked it for this rundown. Uh, the sleeve's quite interesting. They've got these um, thermographic images of the band that run right through on the back as well. And then the spread. Um, the designer was um, Peter Corriston on this, who was... Um, They've done a couple of a couple of other albums for the Stones. He's more famous for um, designing the Led Zeppelin album, the uh, Physical Graffiti. I think that that was his um, his big famous one. But um, yeah, this was um, this wasn't too bad. Some good. Uh, the title track was pretty good on this. That's the first track I heard on the Emotional Rescue. Um, Dance Part One's not 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 a bad opener. That opens the album. Um, but um, yeah, it's kind of okay. Still very Stones sounding, and uh, they still they're still quite young really compared to <laughs> compared to now and. Uh, the media had kind of written them off almost. But uh, anyway, there you go. That's um, number 10 in my Rolling Stones top 10 rundown. Emotional Rescue from uh, 1980. Okay. Now, my next album, um, my f- original draft of this 10, of this next album, didn't appear. I just um, gave a lot of these albums another listening to, and it sort of thought, oh, yeah, this is uh, back in again. So um, this when this came out, I, to be honest, when this came out, I wasn't really into it at all. To be honest, I never really um, enjoyed it too much. I've just kind of grown more with uh, with age for me, I think. And it's uh, 1973's Goat's Head Soup. The famous uh, David Bailey photographs on the sleeve. They got Mick on the front and uh, Keith on the back. Uh, the, other, the other lads in the middle there. But uh, yeah, um, like I say, at the time I wasn't. Uh, I mean, I was, what, 13 when this came out, and I, th- I first heard Angie, which is the lead single, and I thought, oh, yeah, I'm not too sure about that. It's a bit of a ballad, not really. Um, when you're 13, I was into I was listening to things like Slade at the time, you know, and it was like, this was um, not really what I wanted to listen to, so I heard the album and didn't really get into it at all, but uh, over the years, it's kind of really grown on me. And I, to be honest, I did get back into it again, because it was re-released last year, and um, I heard the remasters of that, and um, I thought, yeah, it's pretty good. I listened to it again and uh, it's kind of like made its way back into my top ten. Uh, like I say, um, Angie was the single, first single on this lead single. The other single, I always have to read it because I never remember how many do's are in the title. It's Do 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 Heartbreaker. That was the other single. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting album. So, um, like I say, you've got the, um, uh, what's it called? I've forgotten his name, David, ba- David Bailey's um, photo. Sh- photo um, Graphs on the front and everywhere there. Uh, it was actually designed by Ray Lawrence, <coughs> the um, sleeve design. Uh, the interesting thing about this was um, it was obviously the, the, t- the height of um, Keith Richards' drug problems, and they were struggling a bit to find places to record. They were technically tax exiles, so they, I think they're all living in France or Switzerland or somewhere. And because of Keith's drug troubles, uh, they were having problems finding countries that they could actually play. I think that's why they kind of slowed off on touring a bit, and also to where they could go and record. Um, a lot of this was recorded in Jamaica, because uh, Keith says it's one of the only countries that actually let them in. But uh, what they used to do at this this point, um, and during this class, this kind of, kind of the end of their classic period, um, they used to book, block book a lot of um, studio time, 
and let the um the the songs develop in the studio that was like a free form development kind of thing with the songs and uh, I think on this also um possibly because of uh, Keith not being quite on, on the on hundred percent uh Mick Taylor was getting more involved with the development of um, some of the songs and the sounds and um uh, yeah I think that it's kind of like yeah, moseying on. Although this this was kind of like the start of the decline in quality of some of the songs and the albums, really, before they picked up again later in the seventies. But um, it was it was all pretty pretty good. Uh, it was um, the last one with Mick, uh, not Mick, uh, Jimmy Jimmy Miller producing. Jimmy Miller produced uh, most of their albums during the classic period. So it got that real good classic sound about them, and um, yeah, what I say, good album. Um, Bill Wyman only appears on three tracks as well for some reason. I don't know why. Um, it's never I've never seen that explained, but um, he just was on. I think Mick and uh, Keith filled in on bass on the on the other tracks. But uh, anyhow, there you go. That's uh, Goat's Head Soup number nine in my Rolling Stones rundown. Okay, now if anyone remembers my um, album sleeve video from uh, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned a chap called Gerard Mankiewicz who was um, had. A, had uh, done a classic Rolling Stones photo for one of their sleeves, and this is the one. This is at number eight from 1967, Between the Buttons. And there it is, as a the classic shot of the band, taken on Primrose Hill in London. And I don't know whereabouts on Primrose Hill. Um, I know Primrose Hill fairly well. I used to live quite near it. Um, it's just quite next door to Camden. And um, that shot was apparently taken in the, in the early hours of the morning after um, an overnight recording session or a rehearsal session in a studio somewhere in London. And uh, it's quite interesting that um, on the front, <laughs> you see the very, very tiny album title in Bill Wyman's buttons on his uh, jacket there, which is totally lost on a CD, of course. Pretty, pretty lost on here, to be honest. You know, I can hardly read it. Uh, it's on the back there. Those are the those are the buttons on the back. Uh, the back sleeve is a little cartoon strip by uh, Charlie Watts. Um, it has a poem with it as well. I don't know whether he wrote the poem as well. But yeah, this was a great album. This was their, their first album. They they released two albums in '67. This was the first. Came earlier in the year, and it was kind of like the start of the um, the summer of love kind of sound, the psychedelic and more um, baroque pop kind of thing. The previous album, um, Brian Jones had got a bit more involved in bringing in more eclectic instruments into the um, into the mix. Um, you know, mandolins, harpsichords, marimbas, all kinds of things, mellotron. And uh, yeah, this was really the start of the kind of a change in there, and um, well, uh, moving on with change away from the rhythm and blues roots to a more kind of like an eclectic sound, really. And it was quite interesting. Uh, there was two different versions of this released. Uh, the American version, which happened quite often in the sixties, had a couple of different tracks on "Ruby Tuesday" and "Let's Spend the Night Together," which were both released as singles in the states. Uh, I don't know if anything was left off this, but. Uh, and this is the British version on here. Um, there was no, I don't think any singles were released off the English version because those tracks weren't on this. But it opens up with Yesterday's Papers, then you've got My Obsession and Backstreet Girl, which are three great tracks opening. Yesterday's Papers uh, introduced the Marimba, or maybe is it a Glockspiel or something, something very similar to that. Uh, My Obsession, Backstreet Girl is an acoustic track, brought in more acoustic sounding tracks around this era. And I, I was just, just a really, really interesting album. I. Um, Obviously, I didn't hear it. I was too young to get into it at the time. Um, but I knew all about the Stones in the sixties, and uh, that's um, one of my favourites of the era. That's uh, from 1967, Between the Buttons. So, um, yeah, yeah, the sixties. I remember because uh, obviously I remember Beatle Mania and the, the Rolling Stones. I didn't know too much about. Um, I actually had a uh, a record by a band called the Baron Knights, who were a comedy group in the sixties, and they used to do sort of like montage of different current hits with different words and impersonate the bands. And we did Rolling Stones on that, and it was um, what was it? Little Red Rooster was on that. That's the first hint I mean, the first thing I ever knew about anything about the Stones. Then I heard Satisfaction and a few other singles. But uh, for me, um, seeing them on top of the Pops doing Jumping Jack Flash in um, ninety six J was the one that thought, wow. This I was eight years old. What's this all about? It was black and white TV, so it was, uh, it was still it was still a imp very impactful uh, moment for me. With, uh, all these these strange guys with makeup on, and uh, I always remember Brian Jones with these big wraparound shades like flies' eyes. It's uh, amazing. Anyway, back to the list. Moving on. So we're up to number seven now, and we're um, back to the seventies, nineteen seventy-eight, and it's some girls. 
and this is the one that was kind of a bit of a return to farm. Uh, the two albums preceding this had kind of they dropped off and the uh, farmer dropped off a little bit and uh, this is with Ronnie Wood on board again um, I think this was the second album with him and uh, yeah really really um, really really good album and also a slight change in the um, the sound of some of the track the, um, particularly with the uh, the lead single Miss You which was a big hit for them that, that, that's why they brought in that funky disco kind of sound and I think it re worked really well um, this album actually had um, Quite a few um, singles off it that became radio staples. There was Miss You, there was also A Beast of Burden, Respectable and Shattered, um, which were all pretty successful as singles, and then, like I say, it became radio staples uh, all the time. Back to Peter Corriston with the um, album sleeve design. Um, who, uh, like I say, he did the um, physical graffiti album for um, Led Zeppelin, and here he used a similar um, idea with the old. Uh, the old die cut sleeve with the little interchangeable pictures. Now this sleeve is quite interesting because um, it's based on uh, what was it? The um, Val Valmore or Valmer Hair Products Company. So you mainly did wigs, I think. These are all kind of wigs that they're advertising as well. Their catalogues. And uh, what they've done? I actually thought it was Andy Warhol. And so um, when I first saw it, I thought it was a Warhol design because they, they see the faces of those. Uh, um, Red lips and blonde hair dropped in on the top, like Warhol style, but uh, not Peter Corriston. And uh, there's all these celebrities, um, uh, shots of the band and celebrities mixed in with it. Uh, you've got people like Marilyn Monroe and Lucille Ball, and um, who else have we got there? Bridget, Bridget Bardo, Farrah Fawcett. Um, we've got uh, Judy Garland's on here, which is on the other side of the back, doesn't have the, um, the Warhol treatment. Judy Garland uh, are up there at the top. Now the thing is, when this was released, all those people, all the um, families and agents of these uh, famous people, um, didn't like the fact that they, their images are being used on this album sleeve without permission. So uh, the album sleeve was pulled and changed. So uh, it was all changed. Um, I can't really tell you how it was changed. I think the they, they left the uh, band shots in and just put blank spaces in or something to the others. But uh, I don't know because I never got it because I got the original because I got it when it first came out. Not knowing that there's going to be a problem, of course, and uh, I've still got this uh, original release, so um, there you go. Anyway, the album, yeah, brilliant. Miss You, great track. Beast of Burden, Shattered Amanda, all oh, great tracks. Far Away Eyes is a pretty good track, that, though. That was a B side of um, like a country ballad almost. It was a B side of uh, Miss You. When the Whip Comes Down, um, great. It's a great album, good return to form. The back sleeve has a underwear uh, catalogue on the back there. Very, very strange. But, uh, keeping in the style, I suppose, of uh, sort of like uh, retro ads and retro catalogues. But um, yeah, it was just a really, really cool album. It's good, good to hear them back in, back in the in the game again. Really, uh, did really well for them. And uh, I think some girls has become a, uh, a stage favourite as well. It's a, a live standard they've been doing ever since because they've been carried on touring hugely since um, you know the, every every other year seems to be a massive Rolling Stones uh, tour on the go. But there you go, some girls, number seven. I think it's number seven, yeah, number seven in my uh, Rolling Stones top ten. Okay, so number six. Now, this this one doesn't tend to feature this high in a lot of these uh, rankings. I have had a look, look at out of interest at other people's rankings, from magazines to people's personal rankings. Uh, I don't know why, because I think it's a great album. Um, this is the album that came out uh, in 67, and the same year as Between the Buttons. This was later in the year, towards the end of the Summer of Love. And it's uh, the Satanic Majesty's Request with that uh, famous lenticular sleeve. Now, I um, don't know if you can see that happening. It's the picture of the band in some sort of like, looks like they've gone to the land of Oz. But if you move it around, they all, all the band members move their heads except Mick Jagger in the middle. Give it a sill. So, um, I imagine quite an expensive, uh, quite an expensive sleeve to uh, produce at the time. But um, yeah, I thought this was great. It was obviously um, influenced, particularly the sleeve design was influenced by uh, Sergeant Pepper, which had come out in the middle of um, middle of '67. But uh, they just moved on from between the buttons to this. It was just like too much. It was almost like a parody of the of the psychedelic. Well, the sleeve was, not it? it was like a parody of the psychedelic um, era, really. And um, they'd taken on board loads more. Fantastical instruments and uh, the, the songs are all quite bizarre and um, uh, so like 
nursery nursery rhyme fairy tale type themes of some of them actually, and then the back the back back sleeve and it's all gone Persian rugs and cosmic imagery from sci-fi magazines and Marvel comics and things, and then the the centre spread this um, huge collage of all kinds of things going on there, and then some strange kind of maze in the back there. But yeah, it was quite a Quite a sh uh, um, there's so much to see on it, just too much to see. Apparently, the lenticular bit on the front stuck on the middle there. The original idea was to have it covering the whole front of the album, but that would apparently that put the cost up a bit too much, so they uh, stuck it on this kind of cloud, cloudy background, uh, which is kind of uh, copied on the liner sleeve in you know, the same same thing, but in red. You can see that. Oops, there you go. But anyway, the album, uh, I thought, you know, I think it's just really, really good. Um, like I say, late '67, very second. It was just released not long before Christmas, so uh, imagine it'd be a nice thing to get on Christmas Day. Um, it's got some great tracks on it. Um, opens up with uh, "Sing This All Together," and then um, which is yeah, you know, not too bad song. Uh, second track in "Citadel" is brilliant. That's kind of a real classic kind of Rolling Stones rocking track, but again a little bit psychedelic and a bit you know a bit of distortion and echoey. Uh, middle track on side one, third track in uh, another land, in another land. Sorry, is a bit of an oddity. It was uh, released as a single in the states because, um, like uh, between the buttons, there were two singles off released on this, but only in the states. So it was uh, in, a, in another land, and the oddity is part of it. It's actually um, written and sung by Bill Wyman, the only single that they released from. Um, uh, that was actually sung by him, and uh, one of only about three he actually rec uh, wrote for the band, to be honest. And it's a, a very bizarre song, typical kind of, it reminds me a little bit of Hole in My Shoe by Traffic, also like Mellotrons and strange lyrics about faraway lands and uh, living with the fairies or whatever. So um, it's all a bit um, all a bit odd. Then you got four track uh, on side one is 2000 Miles, which is a great song, kind of a it's acoustic song. Yeah, real you know, good old stones. It was kind of like a nod to what was going to become with a lot of the acoustic bluesy kind of numbers. Uh, it was actually covered by a Kiss on one of their albums. Um, they did quite a good cover of that. And then the final track on side one is called Sing This All Together, Let's See What Happens, which is like, it's like the opening track, but it goes on for almost eight minutes and it becomes kind of like a free-form, uh, I don't know... Um, thing, a, bit, a little bit like, um, let's say, Interstellar Overdrive. By Pink Floyd that came out this year, and then obviously in the White Album they got the Revelation Revolution Number no. Nine, which is very very similar, like um, in you know, the informal kind of stuff going on. What's the word? Free form in um, well, I've got the <laughs> I've got the word for it. Now. But it's all free form and nothing planned, nothing written. Oh, yeah, anyway, I forgot, forgot, forgotten the word. Now I'll probably remember it in the middle of talking about another album. Anyway, so that yeah, and then got sad to got She's a Rainbow, which was the other, the other single. Uh, off, off here, and then a couple of tracks which are the sort of weaker songs on the album, I think, The Lantern and Gomper. And then you got 2000 Light Years from Home, which is one of my favourite Stones songs. Really good. That's got a lot of uh, Mellotron intro and stuff. Uh, almost sounded a bit like Moody Blues and part of it, but it was just really, really good. And, oh, this was around the same time as Moody Blues started out. But that was a great song, and I was happy. I actually saw them on their. Um, what was it called? The. Um, <coughs> Urban Jungle Tour was it called in um, 1990 uh, and they played that on that tour which was amazing I couldn't believe it because we were doing all, all, all doing all the standards you know you, you hung talk with me and uh, start me up and all that kind of stuff and then 2000 Light Years From Home came from nowhere I thought wow I can't believe we're doing this so that made my night but uh, then you got on with the show which closed the album it's a bit of a Cockney by gum kind of, not, not year by gum that's north isn't it but uh, kind of a, a bit of a knees up sound, sounding song with the uh, Sounds like the market vendors in the background. But, um, yeah. The Satanic Majesty's Request from 67. Um, Michael Cooper, his arm sleeve, if you're, <coughs> if, if you're interested. So there you go. That's, um, I'm trying to think of something more to say about it, but I think I've said enough. That's at number six in my um, Rolling Stones album ranking. Okay, top five. Um, Back to my album sleeve video, you would have seen this in that, and it's uh, Sticky Fingers from 1971. So I'll not talk too much about the sleeve, it's very famous, it's iconic, it's by Andy Warhol, and it's um, got a zip. And uh, nothing much on it at all, you've got uh, the, back of the, the back of the jeans there, 
It was um, actually banned in a couple of countries. I think the Philippines banned it and somewhere else. I can't remember where. Seemed a bit too uh, too sexual, apparently. Uh, anyway, so then their, their obviously is replaced by a hand coming out of a tin of treacle, which I thought was look quite disturbing, actually. But uh, I don't have a copy of that, so I can't, I can't show you. But yeah, this was a great album. This was um, the first, uh, well, it was two firsts. It was the first full album featuring Mick Taylor. Uh, the first on their own record label. They'd had a bit of a tortuous um, time with Decca, particularly towards the end. And uh, they were getting um, they were getting censored on some of the songs and some of their album sleeves and whatnot. So they formed their own record label through Atlantic and uh, Rolling Stones Records was um, up and this was their first release. So... Um, Get them a bit more creative freedom uh, in the studio and uh, on the sleeves. But so now I've actually, also if you remember on my video, I've actually lost the insert to here, so I have to remember what's on it. Um, let's see, what's on there? Oh, Brown Sugar, that's on this, yeah. Now, Brown Sugar is one of those classic rock standards, isn't it? It's a Rolling Stones classic and it's also a rock classic. It's just one of those songs. To be honest, I don't need to hear it again, but um, it's there and that, op that uh, opens the album. You've got uh, Wild Horses is also on here, which is another... Um, I can't remember, was that released as a single? I can't remember. I think I've seen it on a, in single format. That was um, written about Marianne Faithful. Uh, so, so I've heard, that's a, a ballad. Um, there's an interesting thing about that. It was actually covered by the Flying Burrito Brothers, um, they were, they, who were um, uh, Graham Parsons' band after he'd left the Birds. And he was a mate of the Stones. He used to hang out with them. And um, the interesting thing was, um, the other Stones, yeah, sorry, you didn't cover that, but the Burrito Rose actually released their version the year before the Stones did. So it was actually a, a cover version of uh, Stones songs that no one had actually heard at the time. So, because um, I think there was a few delays with the releasing this for whatever reasons. Um, it was about kind of a, after their kind of psychedelic bit, and I don't know, um, went back and sort of blues stuff in the late 60s. This was like a. Um, more of a return to the kind of basics, uh, a bit more downbeats, and some really good tracks on here. I've uh, been given another listen recently. You've got Sway, Bitch, uh, Sister Morphine, which is a really good track. That was uh, co written by Marianne Faithful. And uh, another one that's um, uh, one of those um, lost, what do they call them now? Um, deep Cuts from these albums, uh, Dead Flowers. I know, that was a pretty good song. It's like a country rock song. It's um, quite, a, quite a cool song. Uh, again, produced by Jimmy Miller, who was producing during this this period, and um, yeah, I think that's about uh, that's about it for this. Um, well, Moonlight Mile, yeah, it's another track on this. I think that, I think that closes the album, does it? I can't remember. I have to have a look on the thing. I can't. It's on there anyway. Moonlight Mile's on. That's a that's a really good track as well. But anyway, there we go. That's uh, number five in my Rolling Stones top ten. It's Sticky Fingers from 1971. Really cool album. I'll have to find, a, find, find another insert somewhere, sometime. Okay, number four. Now, this is an album I bought relatively recently on vinyl for the first time. I had it on CD for a while. Uh, 1968. Beggar's Banquet. And, uh, yeah, definitely uh, better to have on this original design sleeve. This is the original um, uh, cover design that was rejected by uh, Decker. Who didn't like the idea of having a dirty toilet on the cover of one of their albums? I think I kind of started the decline with the uh, Decca Records, really. So it was a big part of it, and um, I suppose you can see why. In, in some way, just not not particularly pleasant thing to look at. I've seen some uh, dodgy toilets in my time, but uh, that, that takes the biscuit, I think. But uh, yeah, it's a um, great album. This was uh, the last full album to feature Brian Jones, um, although he, he's it's a bit touch and go. His contribution is you know it's a bit a hit and miss I think along the way, but he's, he's definitely there. This is definitely the last one released in his lifetime. Uh, he did make a couple of uh, contributions to the album that came after this, but this was the um, the last one he was fully involved with. And it's just it's got some great stuff on it. Uh, on this album, of course, it has the fantastic "Sympathy for the Devil," which is one of my very favourite Stones. Songs that opens the album, and it's just one of those songs. I think, God, where did that come from? It's like the writing of it, the composition of it, and the structure is just so unique. And um, it's just one song that never fails to impress me every time I hear it. I was listening to it on on my headphones the other day, thinking, "Oh, this is um, 
such a great, great song. And again, one they played live at that show. And I was telling you about when they, the same night they played uh, 2000 Light Years From Home. I thought, wow, this is it. This is all I want to all I want to see. And uh, there was a, a hit single off this, Street Fighting Man. There was uh, another hit. Another one. Was, where are the... Uh... Oh, yeah, just sent a spread there. You've got uh, beggars themselves having a banquet. I can't remember where that place is. That's a stately home somewhere where that shot was taken. <clears throat> Who took the shot? Barry Feinstein or Feinstein. Feinstein was the designer. Uh, actually, the name, the name Beggar's Banquet came from a guy called Christopher Gibbs, who was also known as the King of Chelsea, who was a, I think he was an antique dealer or something, or an auction, an auction um, house uh, owner or something, and he was part of this swinging, swinging scene in swinging London. Apparently, the, the first man to wear flares, apparently, in the 60s. But uh, he came up with the, the title, Beggar's Banquet, apparently. So, so a legend has it. Um, got, like I say, uh, Prodigal Sons a good track. There's lots of really good acoustic songs on here, actually. Um, they got back to that kind of more acoustic blues kind of sound. Uh, Stray Stray Cat Blues in particular. That's what's really good, although rather uh, suspect subject matter, I should say. Uh, Factory Girls, another one. Salt of the Earth, another good track. That's I remember them all now. Can't remember the right order. There's one called Parachute Woman. Remember that one. And Jigsaw, another song. But uh, yeah, there's no, uh, the titles are on, on, on the sleeve, on the back actually, on the graffiti on the back of the toilet there. Yeah, you've got some of the Street Fighting Man there, the Prodigal Son at the top. But, um, yeah, it was a great, great album really. Another, um, This was the first with uh, Jimmy Miller producing, it kind of like got that real good sound. It lasted for a few albums and um, yeah, very... Um, uh, yeah, very good album indeed. Um, the sleeve that replaced it, um, I don't have a copy of it, was um, just plain white with Beggar's Banquet, Rolling Stones Beggar's Banquet, written in a script font to make it look like some kind of like a posh dinner invite or something, but it uh, wasn't really very good at all. It was a bit, a bit crap really, but this is um, this is the one to get and I'm glad now I got it on vinyl. So that's uh, number four in my Rolling Stones room now from 1968, Beggar's Banquet. Okay, so number three. Now this is the album that followed Beggar's Banquet. It came out in 1969, Let It Bleed. With a slightly worse <laughs> condition sleeve, because I've had this for quite a long time. And it had a bit of an accident with some red paints a few years back, so um, there you go. But yeah, this was really good. This was carrying on the good work done on um, Beggar's Banquet. Sadly, um, uh, not not really one of the featuring Brian Jones much. I think it appears on two tracks, I can't remember which ones. And uh, he was kind of fired from the band uh, part way through this. Mick Taylor was brought in to um, help out on a couple of tracks. But uh, yeah, it's just a, just a great, great album. Um, one of the best tracks ever uh, they have ever written on here was uh, Gimme Shelter, which opens the album. We've got the track titles on the back here, but they're not in the same order they are on the album. Gimme Shelter is just a fantastic track, and again, like Simply for the Devil, one of the songs, it's, the, the structure is just great, the way, it, the intro to it, the way it comes in. Still very bluesy and rocky, but there's something quite special about it. Of course, you've got Mary Clayton on um, co-vocals on that, she's absolutely brilliant. Um, it's just a great, great song. Gimme Shelter, of course, became the title of the uh, the film. It was about their um, tour in 69, uh, um, Altamont, the Altamont Festival, it was, it was a bit of a disaster. Uh, you got a title track, Let It Bleed, Love In Vain, Midnight Ramble, another great uh, Stones song. Um, so you, I Can't really get, get What You Want, which I think, was that closing album? Yeah, it has a choir on it at the end. So they did done live a few times, I saw them do that live uh, when I saw them at Wembley Stadium. Um, Country Honk is a track, uh, which I think was recorded before Honk Tonk Women. Um, and it is basically Honk Tonk Women, but in different, more sort of country and western style. And I think the original idea was to have it as a country song, but so then Mick Taylor came on board um, to the Honk Tonk Women single and kind of changed and developed when he came on board and changed tack altogether. Uh, it was a very tumultuous year, uh, 69 for the Stones, to be honest. Um, obviously, they had lots of drug troubles and things, and uh, they were hugely famous, so they, they had all that, that problem going on, and screaming fans everywhere, and... Um, then of course there was the problem with Brian Jones. He was left the band and then he died. And now I think it was on, um, I think the day after his death, they released Honkatonk Women, 
because Mick Taylor was brought in. And then the day after that, they played that free festival at Hyde Park, which became a wake for um, Brian Jones, pretty much. And that was um, Mick Taylor's um, introduction to the band, you know, to, to the live circuit. He played, um, that was his first gig with them, age 20. And then, of course, late, later the same year, he played at Altamont. I don't know what he would have been thinking. But, um, yeah, it was a great, great album. And the sleeve, of course. Uh, design who did the sleeve? Uh, Robert Brown John, who's a US designer. Actually, Robert Brown John's a uh, US designer and um, film titles designer as well. He did lots of um, opening titles for films, including two James Bond films. Oh, uh, which ones were they? Goldfinger, Goldfinger, and I think um, the one before that from Russia with Love. I think he did those two. And uh, so, yeah, it's quite interesting that a record player with all the because um, people. People today wouldn't understand that. It's well, it's all stacked up because, of course, we used to have records stacked up and automatically drop down the next one. When one had finished, one had dropped down, and so on and so on. I think that's kind of cheating. I don't think they were quite ha that high. We've got film can, a pizza, a tire, and a cake. And yes, it was made by Delia Smith. So um, I don't think it's actually in one of her recipe books that the overuse of the Class A cherries, I think. But anyway, there you go. That's uh, Let It Bleed. Great, great album. Number three in my Rolling Stones top ten. Okay, number two. Now, this is the album that seems to appear mostly at the top of um, at the top of lists. It's number two on my list. came out in 1972, and it's Exile on Main Street. A double album, and... Uh, what an album. It's just chock of some great songs. Now, this is one of those albums that um, stays with you. I mean, I didn't hear it at the time. Uh, to be honest, I think the first Rolling Stones album I did hear was um, Goat's Head Soup, actually. That was the first album I heard. I'm familiar with lots of the singles. And I think I had a compilation, um, one of the compilation albums. But um, I got into this a bit later, uh, more in the, in the 80s, I think. And then during the 90s, I had it on CD, where the... The whole four sides was crammed onto one disc, so I don't think the sound quality was that good. Uh, but yeah, this was um, just, just a great album. It's one that you can just dip back into all the time. It's such an epic album. Um, you're all, I'm always finding uh, songs in there, or little parts of songs that I've not, not really noticed before, and then some songs become the favourites, then other songs do, and uh, just just a great, great album. It's a proper good, old, good rock and roll album. Um, songs on here just... Um, Incredible! What it starts off with, we've got um, there's a couple there's a couple of cover songs in here. Actually, there's a lot of um, a lot of original stuff. Obviously, um, we have what's the opening track? Rocks off, which opens up, opens up brilliantly. With Rocks off, which is a cl classic Stone song. There's some great brass arrangements on here as well. Actually, you've got uh, Bobby Keys, of course, is here um, playing the sax. But so, yeah, some real, real good, um, real good brass arrangements and uh, the songs in general. Again, it's that kind of. Um, the way the, the the songs just kind of like evolve in the studio, and uh, there's, there's there's never everyone there at the same time. Sometimes a couple of members of the band will knock a few things together, and then uh, I think Keith Richard wrote there's a song called "Happy," which I think was a single off here. Uh, Keith Richard did by himself pretty much. I think Mick Jagger added on a bit of a uh, background vocals, but yeah, it's just him, the Jimmy Miller, the producer, playing uh, bass and. Um, no, oh, sorry, playing drums and Bobby Keys playing percussion. So there you go. That's a, that was happy. That was a Keith Richards song. It was released as a single and uh, has been a bit of a staple at their shows as well. He, he they sang it when I was um, when I saw them in 1990. But um, just yeah, some great great songs. What are the uh, Shake Your Hips? I think is on here. That's a cover. That's an old Slim Harpo song. I think. You know, where are we? Yeah, hip shake. Shake your hips. Hip shake. Yeah, with Ian, good old Ian Stewart on piano, and there's a there's a Robert Johnson Robert Johnson song on here as well. Which one is it? Um, Love in Vain is that the one? Or am I looking at the wrong? I have to look at the <laughs> look at the wrong album. Love in Vain, which is a Robert Johnson song. I think. Oh no, Love in actually no, sorry, Love in Vain's on Let It Bleed. That's what I can't find on here. Love in Vain's on Let It Bleed. The Robert Johnson song on here. Stop breaking down. Yeah, I should have seen that. She's, I'm going to leave them in there. Uh, start breaking down. But yeah, some great, 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 great um, songs on here. It's just a fantastic album. There's a, there's a track, a really strange track called I Just Want to See His Face, which sounds like a kind of old gospel song. But apparently what happened was it was just, uh, who was it, Charlie Watts and um, Mick Taylor just jamming 
one day, you know, just messing about there, and uh, Mick Jagger just started singing along to it and uh, making up a few lyrics on the way. And so they added a, they added like a, almost like a gospel choir in the background. It's kind of echoey. It's a bit of a, it's almost like it's um, recorded in the, in the next next door room or something. It's quite an eerie little song. And uh, when I found out about how how it evolved, I thought, oh, great, how that was kind of song. And that's how a lot of the Lots of the tracks on from this era did um, did happen. Um, the sleeves are interesting. The sleeves, it's collage of um, basically circus freaks on the front there, all kinds of uh, strange figures on there. Um, on the back, a similar treatment and just shots of the band, which spreads right through. Actually, it's quite a quite a busy busy sleeve. That's a centre spread. All the tracks and uh, all the, the band members. Well, actually, mainly mainly a bit jagged really, but. Um, yeah, it was a great, great album. Um, Tumbling Dice was the main hit off this. Another, another song was just uh, amazing the way it's written. You think about the structure of it, it's just really, really cool. It was recorded in uh, three countries because there were tax exiles at this time. It was recorded in France, in the UK and the States. I can't remember the name of this, this, the studios, but um, yeah, it was um, was pretty good. The sleeve design was by a guy called John... Oh, I've forgotten his name, John Van Hem Hammersveld, who recruited quite a lot of different photographers. I think these were all found images from various places. I think some of them came from a tattoo parlour, I'm not quite sure though. Um, there's a couple of, uh, I think Robert Frank was one of the photographers, another guy called, um, oh, what was he called, Norman Seth, or Seif, or something. But uh, Anyway, number two in my Rolling Stones top ten, Exile on Main Street from 1972. Okay, my number one album. Now, this would be a surprise for most. I don't think it's ever... I've never seen this as a number one choice in anyone's Rolling Stones list. It's my favourite because it just is. Um, it's from 1966. Aftermath. Um, this has always been my favourite Stones album. Uh, like, I said, like I said, I heard the... Um, Ghost Head Soup was probably the first album I heard. I heard this a bit later. Someone gave it to me, actually. I think mean, it's an old original... Bit of a tatty old thing. It's an old mono, an old UK version, and it's just absolutely superb. This to me is the, the Rolling Stones, really. Obviously from the Brian Jones era, and this was their first album they released where they'd written all the songs, all, all self-written. Um, the Beatles beat them to it, obviously, with Hard Day's Night being the first band to write uh, an album of uh, original material, but um, Stones were not far behind. And it is just a great, great album. It's also, interest, interestingly, the longest um, album at, at the time, um, in the, or pop group album. It's 52 minutes long, which is quite you know, quite a long time. And they consider albums are averaging around 40 minutes at a time. And uh, it was um, you know, crammed in a lot lots of music there. But it's just, just brilliant. Um, Mother's Little Helper, first track. Stupid Girl, that, um, great camera, that's that. Choppy Hammond organ on it, and then you got Lady Jane. Now, this is where um, Brian Jones started bringing in all these eclectic instruments. You got like harpsichord, mandolin, marimbas. Marimba features, features quite strong on a couple of tracks here, and Under My Thumb is one. That starts off with the uh, marimba intro. Under My Thumb has become a bit of a standard now, that's been covered by a few people. Lady Jane was just a ballad, almost like a um, baroque kind of um, song really and you got Don't You Bother Me Going Home the final track on side one it's uh, 11 and a half minutes long just a long blues jam lots of that's shakers and it's, it's just real kind of funky kind of sound you're even getting funky back back then in 66 it was just really, really cool and really cool song side two opens up with Flight 505 then you got High and Dry Out of Time and another marimba intro marimba intro uh, that was of course a hit for um, Chris Farlow it's not easy. I'm, I am waiting. Take it or leave it. Think of what you do. It's great. It's great, great songs. It's um. It says we've got some of the instruments down here. You've got so oh, sitar was brought in. Dulcimer and the sitar by uh, Brian Jones. Marimbas, bells, lighting by Mick Jagger. So Mick Jagger did the lighting. I imagine he maybe did the lighting for the photo shoots. I'm not quite sure what they mean by that. Uh, who did the photography? Photography is Guy Webster. And Gerald Schatzberg. Cover design was by someone called Sandy Beach, which I know or I've heard that was actually um, their manager, Andrew Lou Golden, under a pseudonym. So, um, there, but see, I mean, front is quite good. Aftermath, just, uh, no band name on there at all, just the record label logo and the Aftermath. So, it's 
God, but yeah, yeah, just a really, really cool, cool album. This is um, this is where they, where they start to become big business. You know, they're um, a force to reckon with. Up to this point, they did um, this was their fourth release. They did three really good albums in the UK. Anyway, they were predominantly um, blues and rock and roll covers. But uh, now they were just sort of like re they just realised this is where it where it's at. They were the they were the gear. And um, this is still still my favourite um, Rolling Stones album. I just it just it just uh, struck a chord with me. I think struck a few chords, a few harpsichords, should we say? But uh, there you go, my number one uh, Rolling Stones album at the moment. Maybe in ten years' time, I'll revisit the list and see. But uh, to be honest, I can't see any uh, changes afoot. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. That was uh, quite the thing about Rolling Stones. That you try and keep it brief but there's always so much to talk about with them because it's such a such a legendary band really and uh, who knows how much longer they've got in them really they're getting on a bit now uh, and they're so I mean Bill Wyman I know he's left the band but he's um he's in his early mid 80s now so they you know not a not a boy band anymore anyway that's uh, that's me for now so Rolling Stones top 10 I hope you enjoyed that I'll say bye for now <laughs>